Just turn over the service to Dr. Yvette, and we were going to have a missions emphasis this morning, but I, I really feel that we should uh, touch down on this for just a short time before we pass it on. So I want us to look again this morning at living the life that you are called to live, and we're going to look very briefly this morning at this, and mostly it will be review, but we'll look at a few other things as well, and then next week we will finish, uh, we'll finish this series as Pastor Rene is in the Philippines, then next week we will we'll finish this up. So living the life that you were called to live. Paul says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And that's the passage, that's the central, the, the key passage, the key verse out of the passage we've been looking at in Philippians 3. But if you'll remember, we looked at Ephesians 4.1 and in another book, uh, in another letter to another church, Paul writes and he says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Urge is a very strong word. We don't use that very much these days, but it means I, in other translations, I beseech you, or sometimes it is I beg you, I beg you to do this. And so he says, I beg you to live a life that's worthy of the calling you've received. What is a worthy life? What does what is a worthy life lived in your life? What does it look like? What does it look like? I can't say that for you and you cannot say that for me. But each one of us, we can look at what the Word of God says and we can think of what God has done in our lives. And the Greek word for worthy, remember we talked about this last week, the basis of it is a scale, this type of scale. And so a worthy life is this type of life. It's a balanced life. In one side, on one side of the scale is your life. You, personally. This is not just, oh, a generic, oh, our lives are to be balanced. That's not what this means. You, personally, think, my life is on the balance. What is on the other side of that scale? On the other side of that scale, of your life, of your life this morning, is the calling of God on your life. What is God's calling on your life? That's between you and God. You know how God has called you. You know what God has called of you. Sometimes we don't know everything, but we have a stirring in our heart, don't we? We know, we know there's more, there's more. And there's the call of God on our lives. And when the call of God in our lives is not clear, or it's just very muddled or hazy, or well, I don't really know. I, I just want to be a good person, and, and I don't want to sin, and I, I want to make it to heaven in the end. Oh, dear brothers and sisters, that is not what the call of God is. Now, God wants to get us to heaven. That's, his, that, that's in the end, that's down the road, but God has much more for us than that. And there is a call of God on your life and on my life. And if that is not clear to you, I urge you and I challenge you, you spend some time with God, not just a few minutes. God, what's your call? <laughs> you know what? I think if that's what we do, we spend a few minutes, oh, God, what's your call in my life? I think God will probably treat it as seriously as we treat it which is not very, not very seriously at all, right? God speaks to those who speak to Him. God answers those who call on Him. And so we get together with God. We spend time in His Word and the call of God and the, the, the move of God on our lives becomes clearer and clearer to us. And it grows as we walk with Him. You know, I, I know what God called me to many, many years ago. But do you know what I have found as I have walked with God, as I've tried to walk with God faithfully? I learn more about the call of God on my life day by day, month by month. As I walk with Him, I understand more. As I walk with Him, as I try to obey Him, oh, I see more that God has for me. And that's how God does it. And that's what He does in your life as well. That's what He wants to do in your life. And so here we have this worthy life. What is the life that God has called us to live? It's a worthy life. And how do we know what a worthy life is? Our lives on one side of the scale the call of God on the other side of the scale. That's a pretty heavy weight, isn't it? That's a pretty heavy weight on that side. So that's the worthy life. And then we looked at Philippians 3, 
10 through. Uh, we're going to actually, when we get into it uh, next week, we'll go all the way into verse 16. We're not looking at it now, but verses 10 through 14, this passage that we know so very well. I'll tell you what, if you ever think about, I'd like to memorize some verses in the Bible. Do you ever think that? I'd like to do a little of memorization. Here's a great passage for you to memorize. This is a wonderful passage. Start in verse 10 and go all the way through. It's a wonderful passage. It's one, it's one of the foundations of our Christian faith because it talks about how we are to live and how we can live that life. And this is what Paul talks about. So we see it in this passage and then you'll remember the questions that we have to think about. What are the two questions? You tell me. Because we've, we've done this two weeks now and the questions are easy. What is one of the questions? Okay, how do I live the, the life that God has called me to live? And the other question is, am I living the life that God has called me to live? So that's the two, the two questions that we ask ourselves. Am I living the life that God has called me to live? And how do I live the life that God has called me to live? And, the, and that's found in this passage. Hello, Sister Denise. We're so glad that you're here. Amen. Th those of you who say, who's Sister Denise, will you find out after the service? And so we look at this passage in Philippians. And then we look, remember we talked about this last time, if you're going to live a worthy life, Mao, does this mean you have to give up everything, take a vow of poverty, and enter full-time mission work? Is that what a worthy life is? No, God calls us to all sorts of things. And we see in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do it all, whatever you do. And if you can't do it for the glory of God, then you shouldn't be doing it, right? That's right. If you say, I can't, uh, this is not for God's glory, then there's an easy thing. You don't, need any, you don't need a pastor to tell you that. If in your heart you feel and you know, this is not bringing glory to God, easy answer, stop doing it with God's help. With God's help, because it takes God's help, doesn't it? To stop doing the things that we do and to start doing the things that God has called us to do. So whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. God takes pleasure in you fulfilling all of the purposes that he has for your life. Be a good business person. Be a good student. Be a good domestic helper, taking care of children, walking dogs, instead of jerking that dog along because you're so impatient. <laughs> ah, I see things up on my second floor. <laughs> You say, that's awfully trivial, Pastor Jennifer. Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Now, that's just a light example. Um, there, are, there are all sorts of things. But whatever we do, we do it for the glory of God. And if it can't bring glory to God, I don't need to be doing it. And you don't need to be doing it. So we, we see that as a foundation for us. What's the first thing? As we said, there are five points. We've gotten as far as two. And we're going to go over that again. Then we're going to look at some other things. And next week, Lord willing, we're going to finish this. We see in the, the first point, remember what the first point is? The next passage? Dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction. The right type of dissatisfaction. But I want to camp on there just a minute and add another point part to this that we haven't looked at before. And I want to just speak really frankly with you this morning and really honestly with you this morning. How many of you in your life you have ever been just sort of dissatisfied in your spirit, in your heart? You've just been sort of restless. Maybe a long time ago, it may be in the past, but do you know what I mean? There's just a restlessness in your heart. I'm not, I'm not satisfied. There's something, I, I, want, I want more, I want more. Have you ever felt that before? All of us have, have felt that before. What do you do when that feeling rises in your heart, in your life? What have you done in the past? Be really honest and think about it. Have you run after particular things? How do you fill that? How do you meet that restlessness? Sometimes, we run after the attention of others. Sometimes if we are single, and there are a lot of us who are single here in this church, we kind of go after people. 
and relationships, male or female. That's something that we do sometimes. I used to struggle with this much more when I was a younger Christian and, and at, a, at a younger point in my life, in my early 20s, I really struggled with this. I would just be, I'd be just restless, and I would just think, I want something more, I want something more. And often I would run after the things that once I went that way, I'd go out, I'd do this and I'd do that, I'd go after relationships, I might go shopping or buying things or, or, or whatever, and I would go after things that I think, this is what I want. This will satisfy me. And when I got those things, and when I found those things, and when I grabbed those things, and when I ran after those things, I found that I was emptier and hungrier and more dissatisfied than I was when I started running after them. I want to encourage you. When you face that restlessness, that vague dissatisfaction at whatever stage of your life, there are two sides that will always be at work when you reach that dissatisfaction. Always. Always. And one side will be the world and will be the enemy that would seek to pull you in one direction. And on the other side will be God who says, come to me. Let me satisfy you. Let me meet your deepest needs. You know what, brothers and sisters? Very often, that feeling of dissatisfaction, let's be really honest, it does not feel that God will meet that dissatisfaction. It doesn't. It doesn't feel like a spiritual need, does it? It doesn't. It just feels like something I want, something I want, something I... But I promise you, it will be met by God. And when you let God, when you make a decision, God, I'm going to run after you. God, I'm going to go for you. I'm restless. I'm, I'm just, I want, I, I want something. I want more. I want something different. I want more. If you will go to God, I promise you, I promise you, He will meet your need and He will settle that restlessness in your spirit. He will do that. You will never, ever, ever be dissatisfied when you go after God in this area. I promise you that. And if you say, well, yeah, you promised me, but I don't know about that, try it out for yourself the next time you, you struggle with that and see what happens. Paul talks about a dissatisfaction that we are to have as Christians, and that's, that's the first point. And he says, I don't mean to say I've already achieved it, these things. And I, I, that's one of the reasons I really like Paul. You know, if anybody could have presented himself as super Christian, it was Paul, right? Super, super Christian, he's got it all together, he knows all the answers, he's got everything going on. But Paul is really honest and he says, I haven't achieved it yet. He says, I know God has more for me. And you know what, brothers and sisters, when you will be honest with God and honest with other Christians, you are in a place of safety. You're in a place of safety. It is when we try to put up a front and put up a face, yeah, I'm all right, I'm doing okay. Yeah, I know, I know what I'm doing. That we run into danger because that's when the enemy can attack us. But Paul says, I haven't achieved it yet. I still have further to go. And he says, I haven't, brothers and sisters, I haven't achieved it yet. I have not yet taken hold of it. And if you and I are going to live the lives that God has called us to live, there must be something in our hearts that says, God, I'm not satisfied with where I am. The first hymn that we sang this morning, that Brother Chris led us in this morning, Higher Ground, it's one of my favorites. It's an old one. I think it's probably about 100 years old or about 80 years old or so. I I love it because it talks about exactly this holy dissatisfaction, this I have no desire to stay. I want to go on. I want to go on. God, I don't want to stay where I am. I want to keep on going. Brothers and sisters, you are made for more. You are made for more. Are you happy where you are? Keep on going. God has made you for more. There's more ahead. Don't stop there. Don't settle there. Keep going. That's the place of safety. And so there's a dissatisfaction. What's next? The next thing is, let's look at the, 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 the next slide. The next slide tells us that there's a devotion. And we talked about this last time. In the first week, we, we talked a lot about Eric Little. 
uh, one of the heroes of faith. Last week we talked quite a bit about D.L. Moody as an example of this. There's a devotion, there is a focus on one thing. There is a single vision. And when we get the focus, everything else will fit into place. Does it mean that you will only do one thing in your life? No. There will be many things that fit with it. But when you have the one focus, everything else will fall into place. You will have the right priority with everything in your life. With everything in your life. And so Paul says, I've not yet achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. And this is what I do. And this is what I do. And if you and I are going to live the lives God has called us to live, if we're going to live worthy lives, we are going to have to have a devotion, a focus, a one thing. Now, just by way of reminder, let's look again at D.L. Moody, the next slide. He lived in the 19th century. In his day, preached at times to crowds of 20,000. And we talked about that in the first service. I don't know how he did it. Now, you all know I have a quite a loud voice. Um, and you want to hear me in the Philippines and in China when I don't have a microphone. I have a really loud voice, and I'm very thankful for that because I need it at times. But I don't think I have a voice that would reach 20,000. So I think God must have helped D.L. Moody. But when you see the picture of D.L. Moody, he was a big, big man. I mean, really big. He was big. And when you see the, the other pictures of him, he was, as we would say, at least in American English, I don't know if you, what, what else you'd say, we would say he was barrel chested. Do you, do you use that expression? That sounds funny, doesn't it? But we use that in American English, just barrel chested, he had this big round chest. He was a big man. And I kind of think God gave him that physique so that he could, when it was given to God, God could use it for his purposes, right? Sometimes we look at the, the things that we are and the way that we are, and we really, we, we, we wish them away, don't we? We want to be different, don't we? Think, listen, if you give yourself to God, every part of you, body, soul, spirit, God can use it. God can use it. He really can. He really can. And we, we talked about Moody with this devotion. He started out doing so many different things as a Christian. He did this, he did this, he did that. And then he went to New York City after the great Chicago fire to raise funds. And remember what happened? God gripped his heart there. And he said, oh, Lord, hold, enough. He couldn't take any more of God's gripping on his life. And he went back to Chicago. And then he had a single focus and a single aim. How many people, how many people were led to the Lord in his, his ministry? We remember this number, don't we? How many? One million. One million. Estimated. One million. One million. What was his background like? Because we all say, oh, D.L. Moody was so great. He was so mighty. He was so wonderful. Let's look at the next slide. What does D.L. Moody, what did he say? If this world is going to be reached, I am convinced that it must be done by men and women of average talent. After all, there are comparatively few people in this world who have great talents. But we remember, we say, yeah, but D.L. Moody, he was great. He had great talents. Remember his beginnings. His father was an alcoholic who died at age of 41, leaving a wife with nine children. His father died when he was four years old. He had a fifth grade education, he couldn't spell, and his grammar was poor, and he had bad manners all his life. All his life, rough manners all his life. The question is not, how much money do you have? The question is not, what are your great talents? The question is not, what good foundation do you have in the Lord? Remember what his Sunday school teacher said about him before he became a Christian? He said, I've never met someone whose mind was as dark as Moody's in regard to spiritual things. That's what we are before God. But brothers and sisters, with God and in God's hands, the ordinary is extraordinary. The poor is rich. The weak is strong. The blind is sighted in God's hands. In God's hands. Look at the next slide. What did... And we look at the next slide. In the first... 
In 1 Corinthians 1, what does Paul say? And this is a reminder, because this is Moody's life, and it's our lives as well. What does it say? It says, Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes, or powerful, or wealthy, when God called you. God does not have to start with wealth, with wisdom, with power. God starts with people who say, God, here I am, and I'm not much. I'm not much. Now, some of you this morning would say, yeah, but Pastor Jennifer, that's Paul, and Paul was a person of privilege. Paul was a person of great talent, and I believe he was. I think of, 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 of all the New Testament writers, probably no one was more talented than Paul. No one was more educated than Paul. Probably no one was more privileged than Paul when we look at his life. And you say, yeah, but that's Paul saying that. But do you remember what Paul did when he came to the Lord? And that is in that passage in Philippians, in the first passage. Paul talks about, I was this, 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 and this. And he said, and I took all of those things, and those things are nothing that I may know Christ. We take what we are, and we say, God, here I am. Use what you can. I am yours. I am yours. You say, well, I'm nobody special. God uses people that aren't very special. You say, well, I'm not very rich. God uses people who aren't very rich. God is looking for people. God is looking for hearts. God is looking for those who will say, God, I may not be, be very much, but all that I am with all of my heart, I am am yours. And if you will say that, and if you will do that, God will say, here's, here's a person who's living with devotion to me, and I can do anything I want to and anything I need to through this person's life. Amen? Amen. 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 And look at that last one, just as Dr. Yvette gets ready to come in Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit says the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's God in us. It's God in us. And Dr. Yvette is coming now, and we're going to hear some wonderful things about people whose lives are totally sold out to God and living the life that God has called them to live.